Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we'll just give it a minute or so before we start and let, let people join. We've got, as I understand it, over 300 folks registered. Um, so we're, we're looking forward to getting everybody in the conversation. Great, so maybe we'll, we'll get started. Um, good afternoon, everybody on the East Coast and good morning on the West Coast. We're very pleased to have you here. Um, and we're thrilled to be presenting a very timely webinar entitled Disinformation, the Challenges to Democracy. This is sponsored by the ABA section of Civil Rights and Social Justice and the Canadian Bar Association section on Constitutional Law and Human Rights. This panel is part of a series, this is actually the third in the series, uh, addressing critical issues relating to free speech on both sides of the US-Canada border. We're actively planning additional programming on a variety of issues, so I'll use my best NPR voice and say, please visit us at AmericanBar.org slash CRSJ for updates on these programs. This is why I don't have a job in radio. Um, so today's program, we really encourage you to ask a lot of questions. Please use the Q&A function. Do not use the chat function. Um, if you don't see those controls on your screen, just move your mouse around. It might be that your screen is idle. We will address questions during the pre program. My co-moderator, Alan, and I will, will take care of that. Um, and we will be sharing a recording of the program to everybody who's registered. So you can please feel free to share that widely with your networks. So before we begin, we're gonna change things up a little bit and ask questions of our audience. So we wanna know who you are. Um, in a moment, you should see a poll. The first question is asking, how, what's your involvement with these issues? Are you a lawyer, student, academic, non-lawyer advocate, or something else? We'll just wait a moment for the, the results. I promise this is anonymous and won't be used against you. <laughs> Great, so we've got about 53% lawyers, 16% students, a handful of academics and non-lawyer advocates and some others. So that's really exciting to see actually some people who aren't law lawyers and law students. That's a nice, nice change for us lawyers. Um, so the second question is, we'd like to know if you reside in Canada, the US or someplace else. And we promise that this information is not being used for micro-targeting or for any uh, political or commercial purpose. <laughs> Great, and we've got 78% uh, in the US and 20% in Canada. And I would love to know where the other folks are, um, but <laughs> I guess we don't have a, a write-in option. Um, but, but thank you very much. And we're really pleased to have so many folks joining. Um, as I said, we're thrilled to bring you this program today on disinformation, the challenges to democracy. Obviously, false claims and exaggerations are not new to politics or elections, um, but what is new is the technology and the ways in which we communicate. And so, um, you know, there's a good question about whether this more speech and more access that people have is a benefit to democracy or a challenge or likely somewhere, both of those things possibly. Um, so those are the kinds of issues that we hope to get into today. And so I'd like to now turn to my co-moderator, Alan, to introduce the Canadian panelists and himself. Yes, thank you, Claire. Good day, everyone. Uh, I'll start with introducing uh, uh, Eve Gamon, uh, who is uh, one of our Canadian speakers. Eve is a graduate student in law at uh, Laval University in uh, Canada, located in Quebec City. Uh, and uh, Eve's an affiliate of the Quebec's of Quebec's Observatory on the Societal Impact of Artificial Intelligence and Digital Technologies. Eve's work focuses on the risk and benefits of using artificial intelligence to enhance access to ju judicial information. Eve has published work on the regulation of artificial intelligence on AI and privacy. And Eve has also co-authored papers uh, on machine learning. 
Our other Canadian speaker today is Chris Tenove. Uh, Chris is in Vancouver, BC. He's a postdoctoral fellow in political science at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, of course. Uh, Chris has published peer-reviewed articles, uh, chapters in books, and policy reports on disinformation, harmful speech, cybersecurity, and social media regulation. Chris's most recent report is called Trolled on the Campaign Trail, Online Incivility and Abuse in Canadian Politics. Uh, Chris has also worked previously as an award-winning journalist, and we welcome both Eve and Chris uh, to today's uh, uh, webinar. Myself, I'm a senior lawyer. And I'm a solo general practice in Edmonton. I practice in both official languages of Canada, which are English and French, of course, out of offices in Edmonton. Uh, Edmonton is located on the North Saskatchewan River in Alberta. It's within Treaty 6 territory, and I want to respectfully, respectfully acknowledge that. The area is a traditional gathering place for diverse ind Indigenous and Métis people. Their histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence and enrich, enrich our vibrant community of Edmonton and Alberta and Canada. I've been a longtime advocate myself of linguistic rights, and my particular focus has been on minority language rights. Uh, I've worked in, as a volunteer in minority language rights uh, advocacy uh, for a number of years and access to justice uh, for persons uh, who wish to access justice in the minority language, whether it is English or French. For the last several years, I've been a member of the executive of the Canadian Bar Association National Constitutional Law and Human Rights Section. I'm currently the vice chair and I'll be a chairperson this coming fall. So it's a real honor and privilege for our section, I have to say, to have this opportunity to work with our uh, friends and colleagues with the uh, American Bar Association and as well our distinguished panel of experts today to present this webinar to you. I'll ask Claire to get things started now. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Um, let me first introduce Commissioner Weintraub. Um, Commissioner Weintraub has served as a commissioner on the U.S. Federal Election Commission since 2002 and has chaired it for the third time in 2019. Um, during her tenure, Commissioner Weintraub has consistently worked for meaningful campaign finance law enforcement and robust disclosure. She served as a leading voice on topics such as dark money, corporate spending, foreign interference in U.S. elections, the myth of voter fraud, the role and regulation of social media in elections, micro-targeting, disinformation, and faith in democracy. She's published articles in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and leading law reviews, and is a frequent speaker on news shows, and I will add also late night shows, um, late night comedy shows, and at conferences at home and abroad. Um, she also maintains an edgy and informative Twitter feed at Ellen L. Weintraub, so be sure to check that out. Um, I'm Claire Rajan. I'm in Allen Overy's Washington office and I lead the political law practice there. I serve with Steve Romeo as co-chair of the Free Speech and Free Press Committee in the ABA section of Civil Rights and Social Justice. I also spent close to seven years working at the Federal Election Commission, mostly doing litigation and investigations. Um, and in, in full disclosure and transparency, I spent a number of those years also working in Commissioner Weintraub's office. So with that, we'd love to get started and we're gonna have each of our panelists um, talk for a little bit at the beginning and then we will uh, hopefully have a robust debate, no doubt, and, and weave in questions from the audience. So Commissioner Weintraub, would you like to kick it off? Sure, thank you. Uh, and it's a, a pleasure to be here and uh, happy to engage with my distinguished colleagues and with everyone in the virtual audience. Uh, <laughs> even after all these months, doing these things over Zoom is just not the same. Um, I try to maintain an optimistic and positive uh, outlook, but I have to say you are catching me at a morose time. I'm just not feeling very positive these days. Uh, I, I feel like we in the United States are suffering uh, from a real crisis of faith, not religious faith, but faith in our democracy, faith in our institutions, um, a faith in ourselves, really. And I think the disinformation is a big part of that. Um, in the uh, 2016 election, um, we were worried about Russian interference, the uh, bipartisan select 
uh, Committee on Intelligence of the US Senate put out a report on um, Russia's use of social media as part of a four part series on Russian active measures uh, in which they stated in 2016, Russian operatives associated with the St. Petersburg based internet research agency used social media to conduct an information warfare campaign designed to spread disinformation and societal division in the United States. Masquerading as Americans, these operatives used targeted advertisements, intentionally falsified news articles, self-generated content and social media platform tools to interact with and attempt to deceive tens of millions of social media users in the United States. This campaign sought to polarize Americans on the basis of societal, ideological, and racial differences, provoked real world events, and was part of a foreign government's covert support of Russia's favored candidate in the US presidential election. And that was all pretty horrifying to uh, a lot of us in the United States. But what is perhaps scarier is that in the 2020 election, we saw again, uh, a lot of disinformation around the election and continuing after the election around the results, undermining people's faith in the, in the uh, results of that election and whether they were accurate and fair and secure. And that uh, effort goes on to this day. And a lot of that, while some of that I believe has been amplified by foreign sources, a lot of that is coming from inside the house. Uh, it is domestic actors now who are playing a leading role in spreading disinformation, including uh, in, a, uh, in a turn that has proven incredibly difficult to manage and to deal with um, high level people in government. Um, many people who are high level representatives of a major political party. Um, and I mean, I don't mean this to sound partisan, full disclosure, I am a Democrat, but um, I, I am mostly somebody who was worried about the state of our um, democracy. We had, um, uh, you know, back in 2016, even after successfully winning the election, uh, President Trump started his, uh, former President Trump started his um, presidency by complaining about voter fraud in the election that he won. What struck me as very odd at the time, since he did win, and why would he want to undermine that election? Um, uh, and uh, at the time, I, I called upon the president to come up with some evidence for his claims of voter fraud. He ignored me, which I kind of expected. Um, uh, but what was uh, worse was this, this narrative continued to build, uh, and in 2020, really uh, took off in a year in which I was deeply concerned that we about how we would actually be able to run an election in the middle of a global pandemic. State and local officials across the country stepped up, people volunteered, people donated funds, uh, baseball, I'm sorry, basketball teams donated their stadiums. We had such a huge effort across the country and turnout that exceeded not only every expectation, but um, every uh, election uh, that we have data on uh, in terms of how many people actually managed to vote due to the creativity and the efforts of the state and local election administrators. And just to be clear for our Canadian audience, we don't run the election at the Federal Election Commission. That is all done at the state and local level. So I take no credit for the uh, wonderful job that our state and local administrators did. However, um, the, um, uh, we are still, even months after the election, facing a persistent attack on uh, the conduct of that election, an election that the former president's appointed attorney general, FBI director, head of election security at the uh, Department of Homeland Security all said there was no evidence of any fraud that would have influenced the outcome of the election. There were over 60 lawsuits that were filed challenging the results of the election. Virtually every one of them got kicked out of court. There is no evidence that anything bad happened in that election that would have affected the outcome of any kind of massive voter fraud. And yet there is a persistent belief among millions of Americans that there was something fraudulent about that election and that, um, uh, and that Joe Biden didn't actually win. A majority of elected Republican representatives in Congress refused to uh, uh, on January 6th, even after the Capitol was attacked uh, by people who were convinced by this 
why uh, a majority of members uh, of Republican members of Congress refused to certify the election results, again, with no evidence that anything had gone wrong. Um, I think we are reaching a stage where um, people, due to where they're getting their information, they, they, they live in information bubbles, the internet exacerbates that, uh, the internet in a pandemic when many people are stuck at home even further exacerbated that. Um, I think we are, are reaching a point where there are many, many partisans who will not believe that the results of an election were honest if their side lost. And in response to and fueled by all of this disinformation, there are measures being adopted across the United States in state governments that are restricting the right to vote and even more troubling, uh, further making election administration more partisan than it is already. And, and it is already, in my view, too partisan, but they're making it worse to the point where a, uh, a group of, I think, over 90 political scientists uh, in the United States recently issued a statement um, uh, um, warning that collectively these initiatives are transforming several states into political systems that no longer meet the minimum conditions for free and fair elections. Uh, and I think as a result of that, in the next election, if Republicans win, you're going to see a lot of Democrats who, even if the votes are fairly counted, they will not believe that the results were fairly done. People will be disincentivized to vote because they will feel on both sides responding to different narratives that um, the election won't be conducted fairly. And I personally believe that this is going to undermine um, the, the entire government because it will not be a government that is elected by as many people as possible. I think everybody ought to be encouraged to vote. We ought to make voting easy. Um, the, the legal challenges, and, and there's litigation throughout the country over a lot of these measures, the legal challenges that are being brought are largely based on the disparate impact that these measures may be having on communities of color. Uh, but as abhorrent as it is to discriminate against communities of color, particularly given the history of slavery and Jim Crow laws in the United States, not to mention uh, our history with Native Americans, I personally think that it is abhorrent to, tr to try and suppress or discourage any citizen from voting. Everyone should be encouraged to vote. We should, we should all get out and vote and then we will truly have a government that represents all of the people. So um, uh, my concerns about disinformation is that it is really undermining the faith on which democracy really depends. Democracy cannot survive if people don't have faith that the elections are being conducted fairly and that the votes are being counted honestly. And I think we are, we are reaching a real crisis point here. And I, I don't have, you know, we can talk about measures that could be taken to, um, you know, reduce micro targeting or, or um, we could talk about the algorithms that promote the kind of outrage that leads to greater polarization and feeds into disinformation and how people are channeled from uh, into more and more extreme um, uh, information loops online. I mean, this, this, there, there's uh, fake news, and I mean, really fake news, manipulated media, bots that are uh, helping to spread some of this stuff. There's a, there's a lot of topics that we could talk about, but my, you know, my big picture concerns, the things that keep me up or night, at night are the uh, potential impact on uh, Americans' faith in our own democracy. So I'll just stop there on that sunny note. Thank you for the positivity. Um, <laughs> um, we'll uh, turn over to Chris now. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Um, and I'm happy to be speaking today from the traditional and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples. Um, I haven't appeared on any late night comedy shows, uh, but you know, now that I'm appearing here with Commissioner Weintraub, I'm sure the, the invitations are gonna be flooding in. So I appreciate um, that opportunity too. Um, so what I want to do is sketch out uh, two ways that I think um, online communication, which is the area I focus on, is, is challenging democracy um, and specifically 
in a Canadian context, uh, but I, I, I believe there's a lot to, to learn by comparing the situations in Canada and the US. Um, so the two, the two general areas I'm looking at is the vulnerability of media systems to disinformation. Um, and the second is the prevalence of um, online incivility and abuse. Um, and, I, and I've been studying these um, for the last few years, but in particular, as we saw them in uh, Canada's last federal election, which was in, in 2019, um, the Americans in the audience might not have been spending a lot of time thinking about the Canadian election, but we spend a lot of time thinking about yours. Um, and in fact, the 2016 US election was a, a real roadmap for us of places that we did not want to go in 2019. Um, so, uh, before that, our recent federal election, what did the government do to prevent those types of um, foreign disinformation campaigns in particular, um, and some other problems as well? Um, it revamped the Canadian Election Act, um, and Eve is going to discuss, uh, uh, I think, one new provision about false claims about candidates in that, um, in that act. But uh, another key development in it was a requirement for the large social media companies to create um, publicly accessible databases of political advertising. Um, the Canadian government created uh, rapid reaction intelligence and national security teams to be able to identify if disinformation was happening. Um, and it created a nonpartisan panel of senior civil servants who would make the call during the final campaign period about whether there was a serious threat to election integrity to try and depoliticize it and avoid some of the problems, again, that we saw in the United States in 2016, where there are very different partisan views about recognizing or acknowledging what was going on. Um, so how did that work out for us in 2019? Um, it wasn't, I don't think anyone will remember it as the most edifying election, um, but there didn't seem to be any really successful major disinformation operations. Um, but with perhaps one exception. And in the last weeks of the campaign, stories began to circulate online about sexual misconduct by um, Justin Trudeau, our, our prime minister, when he was a school teacher in Vancouver. And some of those stories appeared in the Buffalo Chronicle, which is a site operated by what appears to be a single individual in Buffalo. Um, and stories stated that Trudeau was offering large amounts of money to suppress a story about that misconduct Another story claimed that the Globe and Mail, the national newspaper here, um, faced a legal injunction or other obstacles to publishing about this misconduct. Uh, these stories were false, but they really moved online on social media and may have been viewed millions of times um, on, on both sides of the border. However, Canadian mainstream media largely ignored that story they decided not to give much oxygen to unproven accusations, especially at that critical point in a campaign. Um, and so the, that whole narrative ultimately had really, I think, pretty limited impact on, on, on people, you know, thinking about what they were thinking about um, in the midst of that campaign. Uh, and so that illustrates something important about Canada's media system. Um, Researchers think that the Canadian media system is less vulnerable to disinformation than the American one for a few reasons. And key among those is that there's less alignment between the major news outlets and the political parties. So Canada doesn't have something quite like that plays the role that Fox does in the US. Um, maybe more importantly, the US has what um, some scholars call uh, um, a right wing media ecosystem and that ranges from Fox to, to you know, hyper-partisan outlets like the Gateway Pundit and others. Um, a right-wing media ecosystem that just has less commitment to professional ethics and truth-telling. Um, and, and so conspiracies and stories can live there for long periods of time, even if they've been disproven by other um, uh, news outlets. And Canada doesn't have that, that problem as much. Um, Canadians also have much higher trust in professional mainstream news uh, media than Americans. And so if we're thinking about disinformation in that last Canadian election and this in particular, this Buffalo Chronicle episode, um, a couple of things you know, um, stick out. Uh, on the one hand, the largely trusted um, influential mainstream media in Canada um, acted circumspectly with respect to this um, uh, narrative um, and it didn't have a lot of influence as a result. Um, on the other hand, even without that mainstream buy-in, um, a single individual 
operating from across the border was able to reach hundreds of thousands or perhaps millions of people was something that is not true. Um, so uh, it, it, the story kind of illustrates both the, the kind of resilience of the Canadian media system as it is, um, but also the fact that what's happening in the US and other places, but especially in the US, kind of seeps across the border, particularly um, via social media. Uh, and we're seeing the same phenomenon with respect to false claims about um, COVID-19 um, that um, for on Twitter accounts that are um, uh, sharing false claims about um, the pandemic, the majority of those research, researchers have found are, are false claims that originated with um, US based users. So the Canadian vulnerability to disinformation, um, including in elections is very tied to what's happening in the United States. Um, I'm going to switch gears uh, and then just say a few words about this other issue that I'm, I'm looking at and I think is really important, which is the topic of online incivility and abuse. Um, and I'm, you know, we've all heard about it and, it and it's a problem for a range of reasons. Um, online abuse makes people less willing or less able even to participate in politics and uh, my research, but research from others as well, um, suggests that these obstacles are most severe for women and racialized individuals who are seek seeking office. Um, online abuse and, and um, incivility online makes it harder for citizens to uh, communicate productively. Um, and, and in fact, disinformation actors actively spread disrespect because they know it makes people less willing to um, search information, but also to go beyond their in-groups um, and, and, and have those sorts of conversations. So a blueprint for disinformation campaigns not only includes spreading false and misleading things, um, but it's also really helpful to promote disrespect and to even denigrate um, a political opponents, but um, in election context, also independent agencies, electoral management bodies, uh, professional journalists and other institutions that can challenge false claims. Um, so I think on, in civilian abuse is a problem in itself, but also it's a problem with respect to this issue of of um, this information. And so these are two, I think, really big picture challenges or threats that, that we're trying to deal with. Um, one is how do you promote more robust media systems? Uh, and particularly when professional journalism is, is really struggling and a lot of the decisions about what happens in the public sphere are being made um, by social media companies. Um, and then that second issue about how do you address um, online abuse and it's really another um, online harms. And, and for both of those challenges, you know, social media companies are a big part of the problem and, and, and need to be a part of the solution. And they have done some really um, uh, positive things and I'm happy to talk about those. Um, but I think we also need to look at more forms of, of platform uh, regulation to address these issues. Um, and then the last thing uh, I'll say, and this is really following up on, on the commissioner's discussion is that the, um, the 2020 election is you know, another roadmap for us of a place we don't wanna go. Um, and in, in that one, it, it's clear, um, as you mentioned that uh, you know, political elites were the primary drivers of disinformation um, and disrespect uh, um, during that campaign. And, and those are problems we need to address in Canada too. Um, so one effort that I'm, I'm currently part of is working with um, academics and also uh, an organization, the Samara, Samara Center for the Study of Democracy um, uh, to develop a social media code of conduct for political parties as one tool to encourage um, you know, better use and higher standards of online communication, including in campaigns. Um, but improving the discourse of, of politicians and parties is, is a real tough challenge. And, and maybe that's one that we can return to again uh, today. So thanks. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, Eve, we'll turn to you, please. Thanks. Um, yeah, so thanks to the ABA and the C CBA for having me today. Um, I've, I'm a bit less seasoned than my distinguished colleague, uh, but it's a pleasure to be here. I think I've been invited today to present some work that I've done for Lawfare Blog, comparing the American and the Canadian environment when it comes to disinformation. I will um, drop the links in the chat. Um, so in those pieces, I was mainly um, trying to answer two questions. 
First, is Canada better off than the United States in shielding its electoral system from floods of disinformation? And second question, if so, does it have anything to do with our different free speech tradition? Um, I will tell you the answer right away, then we can go into the details. Yes, we seem to be slightly better off. According to Digital Democracy Project, um, disinformation did not play a major role in the 2019 Canadian national election campaign, as Chris said. And New Brunswick, British Columbia, and Saskatchewan have held their general election, election this fall without any major disinformation incidents having been reported. Maybe it's our lower stakes political environment and more easygoing political culture. Uh, maybe it's our media ecosystem, probably, as Chris explained. But I think that our more permissive free speech jurisprudence might also have a role to play. A modest one, however. Um, I walk you to I walk you through three examples to illustrate the stake. Two of them show how Canada is not so much more permissive than the US regarding limitation of free speech. And the third example illustrates that in some circumstances, however, we are less strict and that seems to help us in mitigating the disinformation crisis. The first example regards fake news, let's say birtherism, for instance. We know very well that in the United States, the First Amendment does not allow the government to prohibit publication of fake news. Uh, so people could pretend that Barack Obama was not born in the United States without legal consequences. Now, what about Canada? Uh, first of all, let's be clear, Canada is much more American than European in its vision of freedom of expression and would most, like, most likely never allow regulation of the like of France's loi fake news or Ge Germany NSDG. Actually, according to the Supreme Court of Canada, it's difficult to imagine the guaranteed right more important to a democratic society than freedom of expression. The quotes come from R.V. Zondel, a decision in which a criminal code provision prohibiting the publication of false information was declared unconstitutional because it was uh, violating Ernst Zondel, a neo-Nazi who was publishing um, pamphlet denying the Holocaust, right to freedom of expression. There, was two, there were two main reasons why the court ruled this way. A, some lives, some lives serve useful social purposes, and B, the line between truth and falsehood uh, cannot be objectively, objectively defined. Take Salman Rushdie's satanic verses, for instance. So a broad prohibition of fake news is unconstitutional in Canada, just as it would be in the United States. But taken a contrario, Zandel provides a roadmap to regulate certain kinds of fake news, those who serve no social purposes and, which are, and, which the, and for which the falsity is easily provable. The place of birth of a political candidate, for instance. Hence, in 2018, Canada, in its Election Modernization Act, updated a criminal provision so as making or, publish, making or publishing false statements about political figures, citizenship, place of birth, education, membership in a group, legal offenses, or prof professional qualification, if done with the intention of um, influencing the results of an election, could result in a fine of $50,000 or five years in prison. Since it was narrowly defined to fit a Zandel criterion, I thought that it, would, that it would stand, even though it might seem outrageous uh, for American in the audience, uh, but I was wrong. In February 2021, the provision, Section 91.1 of the Canada Election Act, was found unconstitutional because it applied not only to false information published intentionally, but also lies that are circulated unknowingly. And the provision uh, won't be reenacted before the next federal election, which could be called uh, as soon as the end of this, this summer. But it doesn't matter all that much after all, I think. Uh, indeed, the provision had existed for about 100 years in various forms, and nobody had ever been convicted of it. So it probably doesn't have a very important role in the fact that Canada doesn't seem to be facing a disinformation crisis of comparable magnitude to the one facing the United States. This brings us, bring us to my second example, which is about micro-targeted ads. In last year's presidential election, Deceptive ads about mailing votings were floating around the internet. The ads were aiming to be misleading for a very specific group of people, minority voters in swing states. 
Um, and this is problematic since misleading messages in micro-targeted ads, as opposed to more traditional TV advertising, for instance, may be seen only by members of the targeted groups, so they can't be challenged by the opposing campaign or the media or uh, Election Canada, for instance. Um, how Canada does apprehend this phenomenon? Well, since 2018, as Chris uh, mentioned uh, earlier, the platform like Facebook have to maintain a registry um, of partisan advertising message and election advertising message for the pre-election period and the election period. Uh, this would not be possible in the US. Indeed, the courts of appeals for the Fourth Circuit decided that Maryland's law requiring disclosure and record keeping of online political advertising was unconstitutional because it would tend to chill speech while failing to address the core problem of foreign election interference. But, and may, may, maybe that commissioner uh, one from, can, can explain me why uh, some ways in which it, it could be possible. But uh, for the moment, I, in my, uh, what, from what I've seen, it wouldn't be possible. Uh, so in that regard, Canada is one step ahead, but this still doesn't go far enough. Indeed, the Canadian ad repository doesn't require advertiser to disclose the targeted audience of their ad and the mandatory online advertising registries. And Canadian freedom of expression jurisprudence would likely not authorize a ban on micro-targeted ads of the like of what uh, suggested by Commissioner Weintraub for the US. So if Canadian environment is better than US with respect to electoral disinformation, it might not be because of its regulatory framework regarding online ads either. The third example, however, is where the difference between the American and the Canadian free speech traditions are more significant. It regards dark money ads. The deceptive messages about mailing voting that were advertised last year in the US were financed by third parties. In Canada, the influence of third parties is limited because these organizations are imposed stringent limit spending limits. This is what we call the egalitarian model. The main rationally behind the egalitarian model is that measures such as spending caps for third party advertisers and registries to enforce spending limits do infringe the right to freedom of expression. Um, but they are never less constitutional because they are necessary to present, pre prevent very rich people from having a monopole on election discourse, discourse, which would deprive their opponents of a reasonable opportunity to speak and be heard. So put it in another way, we're restricting speech in order to promote speech and by the same token, promote democracy. Note, however, that the egalitarian model has some limits. As Canadian might know, uh, it, has, has been, it has been shown by the recent decision rendered by the Ontario Superior Court, which struck down a spending cap that was deemed too severe. So I think it's the main takeaway from my presentation. Canada has a robust protect, protection from, for freedom of political expression, but it is a, a bit more severe in relating what's around speech. And this difference in our respective free speech tradition plays a role, albeit a modest one, in shielding our electoral system from floods of disinformation. So that concludes for me. Great, thank you very much. Um, so before we jump into questions, I thought maybe to get the, the discussion going a bit more or flowing a bit more, um, that maybe Commissioner Weintraub, were there any points in, in those from Chris and Eve that you'd like to, to pick up on? Have to unmute. Um, sure, uh, a couple of points. One, one is I just wanted to clarify that I have not uh, proposed a ban on micro-targeted um, political ads. I have suggested that the platforms would do well to adopt a, uh, a more inclusive model where they advertise to broader audiences. And there have been uh, different models proposed by uh, and adopted by uh, Twitter, spanned all political ads. Uh, Google has uh, taken some steps to try and limit micro-targeting to basically expose more people to the same advertising. It's not a limit on speech. The idea would be to expand it, to, um, uh, to, to make sure the message is heard by more people so that if there is a counter argument, somebody who's more likely to make it will know that they need to make it 
um, and uh, Facebook is um, not doing as well, I think, in the uh, area of, of micro-targeting. But I, I have proposed this as something that the platforms ought to do. It's good corporate citizens rather than as a, a form of, uh, of government regulation. Um, uh, one, one topic that I think was um, alluded to by uh, Professor Denov. Am I getting your name right? <laughs> oh, good. Uh, sorry, I hate to mispronounce people's names. Um, is the role of um, mainstream media and particularly local media. I think when people talk about the, um, the role of social media and the internet in spreading disinformation, one, one aspect of this that I think is underappreciated is how the internet has um, uh, sucked up so many advertising dollars that it has completely undermined local journalism. There are local newspapers across the United States that are closing down uh, because they, you know, without the advertising, they just can't stay in business. And uh, that is a real loss for democracy. Um, that used to be a very trusted source for a lot of people. They're, they're local journalists who knew their community well. Uh, and because they were part of a, an established journalistic enterprise, they're more likely to engage in fact checking. And they're also great watchdogs uh, against the potential of local corruption. I mean, that's not a disinformation problem, but it is a problem for democracy when, uh, when officials are corrupt. And uh, who else is going to look out for uh, the victims of local corruption other than local journalists and local watchdogs because it doesn't rise to the level of national attention. And um, this um, real sea change in the way news has been, uh, is, is presented to people uh, much more online and uh, with local newspapers closing across the country really is a substantive denigration of the amount of trusted information that's available to people. Um, you know, we tend to think about national elections, but there's also a lot that goes on at the state and local level uh, that people need to hear about. And um, again, that's a place where you really can't replace the role of, of local journalists. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, right around the election itself, when, you know, of course it took a few days before we had uh, all the results in, in this election because there were a lot of mail-in ballots and because there uh, were jurisdictions that allowed uh, counting of mail-in ballots that were received within a, a small number of days after the election, as long as they were postmarked by the election. So it took a few extra days to, to uh, get, results. And that was a very fraught time. And during that period of time, Facebook actually responded by changing their algorithms for the news that people were getting in their news feed. And they, um, uh, some people refer to that as the nice feed, uh, where they were promoting authoritative sources and um, uh, downplaying the more uh, extreme voices and uh, the conspiracy mongers and the uh, um, more partisan voices. And that was great, but they stopped it in December. You know, that it only lasted for a little while and then they went back to their old habits. And uh, I think that is a, a real shame. You know, one of the big problems with social media is that they want to keep you on their platform. And um, I don't know who coined the phrase and enragement is engagement, but they, uh, they try to gin people up in order to keep them on the platform. And I believe that during this window of time when they were uh, promoting more authoritative and less inflammatory resources, people weren't in fact spending as much time online and then they go back to their old business model. Uh, they make money based on uh, how much time we all spend scrolling through our feeds. Um, uh, and that is not the best way to get informed. Uh, I think we need to, um, uh, it's been recommended by a number of people, we need to do more about media literacy, trying to help educate people about um, uh, better sources of information and what is a trustworthy source of information. Uh, I convened a forum at the FEC on disinformation and one of, I, I can't remember which of the uh, uh, many wonderful panelists we had, the, you can see the whole program on my website, um, but the, uh, one of our panelists said, when we talk about media literacy and education on this, 
we, you know, people think about education and they tend to think, oh, we need to educate children uh, from a young age how to evaluate information. And that may be true, but the younger generation, which grew up with the internet is far more sophisticated. And in fact, what this panel was suggested was that we need to have media literacy programs in senior centers and in, uh, in places where older citizens congregate because they are um, uh, often the least savvy about the information that they're getting and the most likely to spread um, information that is um, perhaps not very authoritative. Uh, I think the platforms have taken some steps to try and um, uh, address some of the rampant uh, viral disinformation that's been going on uh, after some truly horrific uh, incidences in other parts of the world. Uh, WhatsApp limited the number of people that you could share a message with. So instead of uh, these messages going viral, they could only be shared with five people. Um, and there are steps like that to limit virality that I think the, uh, the platforms have taken some steps to adopt, but probably could do more and still need to do more. You know, we just, I, I keep coming back to this issue of uh, the spread of authentic information versus inauthentic uh, and less trustworthy information. And I do think that the platforms really have to uh, own more responsibility for that. Chris, did you want to chime in there or you're nodding I'll make, along? I'll just make a really short point, I think, on the, uh, along similar lines to what the commissioner was just saying, which is that um, and this also gets to uh, uh, one of the questions actually that I saw, which is about the challenge of dealing with disinformation at its source. And I think that that's very true. Um, the, um, one of the ways in which we, we address this problem is in, in part shifting the attention a little, a little bit from trying to remove problematic speech to boosting the source or the, the um, accessibility across audiences. Uh, to higher quality information or to corrections. And so there are all sorts of efforts that the platforms are doing of using labels and other things to alert people when there are problems, potentially false claims and what they're looking at, not to just remove that, but to say, hey, you might wanna look here, you might wanna go to this World Health Organization site or, or that sort of thing. And I think that's, that's important. And it, and it somewhat relates to the kind of philosophy of the these parts of the egalitarian model that, that Eve was talking about, which is an emphasis not just on people being allowed to express things, but some recognition of that people need to be able to encounter things and listen to a diversity of views and perhaps more likely to encounter um, more uh, authentic and, um, and accurate um, information on topics. Um, and so, that, so as I was saying, the platforms are doing lots of interesting things here. One thing that I, as a researcher, would really like is the ability to access more data from some of the, these platforms. So we could really help provide, um, you know, an independent assessment of whether these different um, approaches are working. And I, so I think that's an, an area of, of policy that sometimes gets missed, but that I think there could be real, like across the spectrum support for, which is ways to, um, while not having platforms disclose um, kind of rashly people's private information in doing so, but to be able to share data so that we can really get a better sense of what people are consuming and, and how these different types of information campaigns are happening and, and, and whether these solutions that the platforms are trying are working. Right. Um, thank you, sorry, Eve, did you wanna add anything on that or should we jump to questions? I think we can jump to question. Great. Um, so I think it's really interesting that each of you picked up on the, the relevance um, of media in this. And, and so I, and I was struck, Chris, by your point about there being some, some sort of fake news stories circulating, but they never really got picked up in the national media and so never really became a thing. Um, that is not necessarily the case here. But it also reminded me of, and Ellen, you'll remember this 10 plus years ago, uh, you know, university students are saying that they get more of their news from Stephen Colbert than from, you know, traditional news media and nobody buys newspapers anymore. Um, and so 
that's sort of been taken over by social media and these um, other sources. And so I'm wondering if you just expand a little bit on, is it so much, it, the notion behind social media is that that's actually more um, sources of information. And so that should be better than the sort of big corporate, um, you know, limited sources of information of the traditional news media. And so is there a way to use that as an advantage um, as opposed to only a disadvantage? So maybe Chris, you're nodding, so I'll turn to you yeah. first. Yeah, Sh sure. I, so um, I think it's true that, uh, so first of all, we should say the mainstream news is not and has not always been great and has excluded voices and made mistakes. And, and we don't want, you know, the 1950s networks, few networks dominate everything, information sphere. Um, uh, and so having lots of different sources of information that people can go out and, and look for um, and uh, corroborate or disprove things is, is um, in many ways an advantage um, to where we were. Um, also, uh, mainstream news in particular still has a real impact on the conversation online, even if it's not, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's generating material that is sparking conversations, it gets linked to, you know, all sorts of things. So it's still playing a real role on social media. And I, and I think that, um, you know, and, it, and um, uh, it's true that younger demographics are more likely to be getting to it through social media or mediated by that rather than going directly to, say, the sites of uh, news organizations. And so that's a shift that we well, you know, may well see persist. And, and, um, and so that's gonna be something we'll have to grapple with. Um, but I think um, it's also true that in studies, we find that um, for people who are kind of high information, really interested in politics, they can get news from a range of sources and um, often good ones and bad ones. And, and you know, they might not always come to the right conclusions or maybe there aren't right conclusions. Um, but I think some of the demographics we're most worried about are low information, less likely to seek out stuff, and maybe more likely to have a very narrow stream of information they're getting that could, through various techniques, be you know, um, quite misleading. And we see that um, too in surveys and, and research in the US after, after elections about some of these, and, and in the US it happens to be more on the conservative side, these certain demographic groups that are just um, having a, a, a pretty polluted information feed. And, and that's a real tough one to figure out how to, how to reach those groups. Cause um, you know, media literacy is not, it's, is, is a very slow um, and um, important but difficult approach to try to address that problem. Yeah, thanks. Eve, do you have thoughts on that? Uh, well, maybe just, like, I really like the fact that we insisted on uh, how media ecosystem is the, the, main, the, 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 the main point to, to think about these days uh, with documentary. Like, I, I feel we are often talking about uh, social media's Facebook, Cambridge Analytica, and um, the oversight board of Facebook. And it, it gets, there's a lot of fuss around, around this. Um, and we often do not talk enough about those major questions. And I really appreciate that we do take time to, to do it today. Thanks, Commissioner Winton. Um, yeah, one thing that I wanted to point out is we're starting to see, and you know, it's not terribly widespread yet, but, but we have seen it in, in certain locations, a new phenomenon for the United States. Um, it's something that I encountered years ago in doing some comparative work on uh, the US uh, and India. Um, but now we're, I saw it in India, now we're seeing it here is this notion of paid media where um, there are, and, and this again is in online um, uh, venues where uh, an entity will spring up and it will have a lot of sort of uh, non-controversial local news and seems like a good source for local news. But when it comes to politics, they actually, uh, they are running articles that look like they are neutral um, uh, articles being run by some journalists. But in fact, it's being commissioned and paid for by various politicians and has a particular slant. Now, of course, news often has a slant, but we 
we assume that that's because of the bias of the news organization in some instances, not because that they are literally being paid to uh, put out the news. And again, this is a problem of disclosure. Um, you know, one issue that we work on a lot is Claire knows that the FEC is uh, trying to make sure that people know where the information is coming from. Uh, and, uh, and if something is paid for, then the person who paid for it, should, their name should be on there somewhere uh, so that people can judge the credibility of it and, and at least see the, if there's a, a clear conflict of interest there. And um, people are, are, as they will be, uh, creatively trying to find ways around it. And some of these new paid news outlets uh, are uh, uh, another venue that I think is sort of flying below the radar for a lot of people, but it's, uh, it's, it's something to watch out for. Alan, did you want to jump in with a question? Yes, sure. Um, you know, this is all, of course, about uh, what are the limits to free speech, uh, as it's referred to in the American Constitution, or freedom of expression, as it's referred to in the Canadian Charter. And I mean, you know, I think back to when I took ethics in my philosophy days. Uh, you know, there's limits of things. For example, we can't show up fire in a crowded theater and now is is this information kind of akin to that in the sense that you know uh, to what level and we've some of you have spoken to that eva spoken for example to regulation in canada for example uh, over social media platforms and so is chris uh the um you know to what extent can can policies be put in place uh that balance between the the right to free speech or freedom of expression and at the same time attempt to deal with the uh, dissemination of hate speech and disinformation. And I guess another aspect of this is, you know, to what extent can the public be better educated or informed even at the school level? You know, at school, in school we're taught, at least we were taught in our schools uh, to try to think critically about the things we hear. So at the education level, that's gonna be a real long-term thing, but in the, in the here and now during political campaigns or just generally, what steps can perhaps social media platforms and other platforms be used to better educate the public to think critically about the information they're receiving uh, and, to, and, and to balance uh, on that. So I'll, I'll leave that open to all of you to consider uh, some response. Thanks. Feel free to jump in, whoever <laughs> wants to. Maybe Ellen, want to start off? Well, I, uh, I've, I've already commented on the need for greater media literacy, but you know, as uh, as Chris said earlier, you know, so that's a and and as you said also, Alan, that's a it's a long term project. Uh, I have read some uh, research that shows that um, encouraging people to at least examine the source of the information, to do a quick check on where the information is coming from is actually a pretty good way of uh, getting people to focus on, on how credible it is, uh, as opposed to trying to make people go out and do intense research on every fact that is um, uh, present in the information. So I think that's um, uh, I, I think that's one promising angle because it's it's quick, you know, you, you, you just check the source. Now, of course, what I consider a reputable source and what somebody else considers a reputable source are, are, are going to vary, but um, uh, at, at least you have that to go on, the, uh, whether you can make that determination for yourself as to whether it's credible. Um, you know, we... This issue of uh, whether uh, Canadians egalitarian model versus the United States more libertarian model that um, you know, we wanna have promote as much speech as possible. I, I've always been fascinated that two countries that are uh, neighbors and have somewhat similar uh, constitutional backgrounds and historical groundings in the, you know, in the British Commonwealth long ago, um, come to these issues from such different perspectives where, but with the same goals that both the United States and Canada, the, in both the United States and Canada, the goal is to have the most robust political debate with the notion that, you know, if you get a good robust political debate going, people will be able to find the best ideas and, and, the, and, and will be able to come together around policy solutions. But in the United States, 
the, uh, what the Supreme Court has handed us is uh, jurisprudence where the best way to get the most robust political debate is to have as few limits as possible, not only on speech, but on the money that supports speech. And I would take issue with the um, equivalence that is sometimes drawn between money and speech. Um, obviously, it takes money to get your message out, particularly in a country as big as the United States and with so many media markets. Uh, but um, uh, allowing unfettered spending in our elections is um, uh, not necessarily the way to get the most robust debate going. The, um, the, the Canadian model, which again, with the same goal, comes to the conclusion that in order to get the most robust debate, in order to have the best informed electorate, you can't allow unfettered spending because then the person with the most money uh, can drown out the views on the other side. And um, I, I, I admit to finding that somewhat appealing uh, as, a, as a philosophy, but uh, that is not the, that's not the deck that I was handed. Um, so I have, to, I have to work in the world of uh, United States jurisprudence. Um, you know, I've, I've seen some uh, uh, political scientists who've done some research on, on this that debate whether um, there is a, uh, there, there is such a thing as a free um, uh, marketplace of ideas where the best ideas rise to the top. Uh, sometimes, unfortunately, it is the most inflammatory ideas that that rise to the top. And, uh, and certainly, you know, I'll go back to what I was saying about Facebook's feed and, and, ha and the, they, they are making choices for us in the way they program their algorithm as to what kind of information each of us is receiving. Um, and as Chris has pointed out, they are not very transparent <laughs> about what's going on in those algorithms and how they are, and how they're making those choices for us, uh, and I, I join him in thinking that that would be a real improvement in everyone's understanding of our of the information ecosphere that we all operate in. If we could find out more about um, exactly what is motivating those um, uh, those decisions and and uh, what pops up in our feeds. Maybe I'll, I'll um, uh, kind of build on that, but also circle back to that question, Alan, about the balancing free expression with addressing some of the, these online harms. I mean, I think that, you know, in very broad strokes, the path forward um, has, you know, two key elements. And, and one is identifying a pretty narrow range of um, harms that are perhaps already in existing criminal law or electoral law or others um, that uh, um, can be enforced online quicker and more reliably and dealing with some of the jurisdictional issues um, uh, than is currently the case. So that if there are um, say uh, defamation or, um, you know, or hate propaganda uh, in Canada, you know that some of these things can be can be acted on, but they're they're going to be quite narrow. And then there's this 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 broader problem, and I think most of what is the disinformation part of it is here, which is how do you just develop better professional judgment by those who are sure consuming information, but in particular are, are real gatekeepers or facilitators or brokers of information. And again, I often focus on the social media platforms here. So how do we how do we get them to make better judgments about things? Um, about how to, um, uh, what information to share, how to design algorithms, how to, how to design the interface so that we're less likely to quick uh, and quickly share inflammatory things without reading it. So an interesting thing Twitter and I think others have been doing is, you know, introducing a little friction. So if you retweet before you've read the linked piece, it says, if you want to read that. I mean, I think those are great um, experiments. We'll see whether they work or not. And, and, Doing more of those is important, but I, but you know, um, what's necessary, I think, for real progress on developing better ethical and professional judgment about these things is is having some sense of connecting to a broader public interest. And I mean, you know, listening to the commissioner, but also reflect on U.S. politics. I, I um, at the moment, there does seem to be 
this is one of the real risks of, of polarization is wet is when it becomes very hard to see outside of a, a zero sum game to see what the broader public interest is and how kind of principles about say making good decisions about what sorts of information to share whether to reduce the spread of false claims about what happened in the recent election, all these sorts of things. Um, it becomes very difficult to articulate and develop professional ethical practices um, without some of these like um, bedrock um, understandings of a public interest. And um, you know th that's a tough problem, but I think there's a lot of things that we can do um, to at least um, promote a conversation about what professional ethics look like, create um, institutional forums for it. Um, I produce uh, I and others in Canada have suggested a social media council or a content moderation council as one way to formalize and force these discussions that bring um, folks at social media companies into public conversations about the decisions they're making. Um, and, and then I think, yeah, trying to crack down on those narrow but um, uh, uh, discrete and very harmful things and, and see what effect more broadly there are of being more effective on addressing those. Do you have a? Eve, did you have anything to add to either of those comments? Um, no, maybe uh, I may, maybe we can go to questions. If not, I I have some questions to ask Chris, but uh, maybe that we can go uh, to the audience. Uh. Sure. Go, why don't you go ahead and ask Chris your question? Uh, actually, uh, since he was alluding to uh, to social media and content moderation initiatives. In Canada, I was wondering if he has a take about um, the upcoming possible relation in Canada that we uh, for online harms and uh, which so yeah that Stephen the minister Stephen Gilbo is proposing uh, to to publish in the upcoming days. Yeah, um, well, and just for the American audiences, you know, um, as in you know, various European countries and elsewhere, um, Canada has been trying to think about new um, regulatory or legislative approaches to um, address a range of, of online harms. And um, there's been talk about it. Uh, it was in the, the current Liberal government's platform, you know, when they ran in 2019, that they were going to address hate speech and some of these other online harms. And so we've heard that there is a legislation that Previously, it had, you know, it was supposed to come out earlier in the spring, and now it looks like it might just appear before um, the parliament um, ends. Um, but, and the general approach is to focus on, I think, five discrete types of online harms. Um, they include um, uh, uh, child pornography, the um, uh, sharing of um, non-consensual sharing of intimate images. Um, hate speech and a couple others. Um, and then some mechanism, the it looks like creation of an independent regulator who would be tasked with making requests of social media companies to take them down. Um, at least that's my read of it, but we really don't hear the details. And I think it's, um, you know, there's a lot to, that we can learn from looking at the different countries that are trying things. Like Germany is one approach, UK is going somewhere very different. Um, France had some very specific um, laws about uh, uh, empowering um, judicial bodies to um, demand quick takedowns of false information in electoral contexts. Um, many of these have at various points run into problems in the courts. Um, and, and so we're at an interesting point now for Canada, but you know, um, other countries too, where there's a, a lot of different approaches to, um, to trying to, to um, deal with these uh, types of speech on social media. And, um, and I really wanna see what our government tries and, and whether it works. And so it's a shame that we might not really um, see it uh, anytime soon, but you know, hopefully, hopefully we'll be, get to have it out and to have that debate about what, you know, what can get buy-in from um, you know, the public and, and stakeholders. Thanks, so I have a question. Um, sort of pivoting slightly or maybe narrowing slightly on micro-targeting. And maybe it's a bit of a controversial question, but 
is micro targeting just effective advertising? Is it really new? Um, what's the big deal? And so, you know, I remember a case that I had at the commission about billboards, right? And the billboards were going to be in the most effective place, which meant battleground states um, and where a lot of cars are driving by and where the results are close. Is that sort of old school micro targeting? Um, why is it different now? Um, and and you know, if we don't hold the billboard companies accountable, why are we focused on social media companies? Well, Claire, I think billboards are the opposite of micro-targeting because they're big and they're out there for everybody to see. And maybe it'll be only the people that pass along that road, but still they're not being hidden from anybody. And the, the risks with micro-targeting is that they, the media platforms use the data that they have collected from us without most people really consciously giving permission to have all of this information about us scooped up and used to target us. You know, that's, I don't even like it when they're targeting me with ads for shoes, but you know, when they're, when they're targeting people for their, you know, trying to get them on their views about democracy and persuade them to vote one way or the other, I think um, it, it really is a very troubling phenomenon because, the jurisprudence in the United States is based on this premise that, you know, don't have any limits. If you don't like what somebody is saying, you get out there and make a better argument. You have to know they're saying it in order to make the better argument. That's the problem with micro-targeting is that it is going directly to the people who are going to be most susceptible to the arguments that are being made, and it is not being shown to the people who are most likely to raise objections and to, and to realize that, wow, there's an argument out there that's just crazy or that's just wrong or it's based on inaccurate information, and I should be out there uh, trying to make the better argument against it. That's, that's the problem with micro-targeting. My views on micro-targeting is that we just need to open the, the funnel more so that more people get exposed to the argument and you can have a more robust debate about it. And See, I, knew, I knew we'd get some controversy going with that. <laughs> Go ahead, Eve. If I can continue, there's also a problem that I see in uh, micro-targeting is that uh, we are targeting people with for reason that uh, we, sh we, 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 we do not consider acceptable. I think of, for example, of targeting Jew haters for, uh, for an ad. Um, this doesn't, just doesn't seem right. Like you cannot, already it's not public to end, the message is not seen by everyone. And it's targeted at a community that uh, is particularly sens sensible to, uh, inflammatory messages. So if at the at the very minimal we were tar uh, prohibiting some sorts of targeting uh, on this discriminatory grounds, maybe it could be less of a problem. But uh, yeah. And and just to maybe be even additionally inflammatory, Claire. I mean, maybe the problem is that it is exactly what you say. It's just very good advertising in that it can leverage more than most other forms of advertising, both the lack of broader awareness and the ability for others to counter it that the commissioner spoke of, but also that it can be tailored to biases, to areas of ignorance. I mean, it's not hard to imagine the ability to tailor more to um, indications of people's state of mind based on what they've been posting recently. Um, we're not seeing much of that, but I don't see why it couldn't be done. Um, and that, um, yeah, for, for other, even outside of politics, it could be very problematic, incredibly manipulative, and that um, I and and some others have, um, you know, suggested that it might make uh, sense to have more public registries of advertising in general, um, and not only political advertising. In part because defining what is political advertising and issue advertising and distinguishing it from other stuff is, you know, incredibly difficult. So you can deal with that problem by going really broad and just saying, um, we don't want this kind of targeting um, behind people's backs. Um, on the other hand, the targeting can be very useful, um, but I think it needs to be more, um, more transparent in general about including to the people getting targeted about, about why they're getting what they're getting. If I, if I might add on to that, one, one issue that's been raised about maintaining these ad libraries is that they become so uh, cumbersome and uh, unwieldy because there are so many different ads and 
uh, what you can do on these platforms is you tweak it just a little bit each time to try and make it even better for this particular group and that particular group that you're micro-targeting. And what you end up with is, uh, even for the platforms that are maintaining them, and some of them are, uh, this huge flow of information that nobody can actually figure out what to do with. You can't really do any research in there. You can't find the particular ads because there's there's too much information. It's kind of like um, in litigation, Claire, where uh, somebody, uh, uh, submits a discovery request that is perhaps not so artfully worded and the response is to just bury them in paper so that they can't find the actual piece of paper that you know they are really looking for. Um, so I think that is, um, that's a, that's a it, it's, it is a good idea. I'm in favor of having um, these repositories, but I think it, it doesn't solve the problem. It's, it's not a, um, you know, we can't just check that box and say, well, okay, we've got that information out there and now we can move on to another problem. I, I would also like to know, we, this hasn't really come up yet, but uh, in the background of all this is um, uh, in the, what we call in the United States, Section 230 of the Communications Act, which uh, gives this broad immunity to the platforms for um, uh, uh, they are viewed more like a pipeline and not like a traditional media enterprise that has some editorial control. And so they're not resp held responsible for the some of the bad content that ends up uh, being disseminated on their platforms. And there are there's a lot of interest in the United States from people from a wide diversity of perspectives and for very different reasons sometimes in trying to cut back on, on that broad immunity. Uh, I have proposed in a uh, uh, law review article that um, one way of uh, trying to get at this without going at the content of the material uh, would be to make the platforms pay for the information that they're sucking out of all of us. Um, uh, now it wouldn't probably amount to that much money going to any particular individual, but if it was a non-waivable fee and there was a small surcharge on top, you could collect information from the platform, you could collect this money from the platforms and use it to support programs for media literacy or local journalism or public journalism, or uh, perhaps even public funding of campaigns, uh, you know, choose your, choose your remedy for uh, all of this. But uh, it seems like they are getting a whole lot of free information that they are monetizing from us. And um, uh, they, uh, I, I think we ought to have them chip into the effect on democracy that they are, are having as a result of that. I know we talked about the decline of print media in the context of this discussion today and, and the loss of local papers, uh, that form of, uh, you know, that having that paper in your hands, people aren't seeing that as much and not using it. I don't know if we're overstating the role of social media in this whole thing, but are there in any of your views, um, other mechanisms, um, perhaps we can fight fire with fire in the sense that, you know, if the disinformation crisis is largely rooted in the use of the internet and social media and other platforms, are there other mechanisms that we can use for harm reduction in this context? And, you know, I know, You've mentioned, uh, I think, uh, I know Eve's talked about uh, artificial intelligence as a role, and maybe there's algorithms or bots, maybe, maybe those can be used to counter misinformation. I don't know if that, what are your thoughts on that, folks? Um, oftentimes, I, I adopt a position uh, with respect to artificial intelligence, which is uh, not uh, against techno solutionism. Uh, like, we like to think that technology is awesome and can solve all the world's problem, but it's often not the case. And we may, might go to low tech solutions and look at what we've done for many, many years as uh, education and not believe that uh, technology is, is, the, is always the answer. Uh, I think that we really much should prefer uh, lower tactic solutions than instead of artificial intelligence. Yes, we can tweak the algorithms uh, of, and Facebook can tweak its algorithm to uh, promote uh, trusted content in, and decrease the, the, the how we see like less trusted uh, content. But 
I, I don't believe that it's a, it should be um, our go-to solution. I think there may be, I think there's a difference between certainly Canada and the United States in terms of government intervention in this context. But I mean, how much can we rely on, for example, Facebook to, to uh, suspend former President Trump's account on the one hand, and maybe should there be some form of government res regulation that would act as a harm reduction mechanism? Or are there other harm reduction me mechanisms, mechanisms any of you can suggest uh, to control the dissemination of this information and hate speech? Now then, any one of you to jump in. Uh, I don't know. Chris, you, you unmuted yourself. No, go for it. Eh? But I, I think that in Canada, we have, a, a, we, we, we have a public television and public broadcasting companies, and those are important. And if we can fi found, if, um, finance those institutions, uh, this might have an important impact. Uh, other than that, um, of course, there's many other solutions, but uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I just, you know, if I'd been told a year or two ago that, that Twitter would permanently ban Donald Trump and Facebook would do it temporarily, I, I wouldn't have believed it. Um, it, it. It is a really tough decision and, and politically and maybe even market-wise dangerous decision to um, address um, um, highly popular um, powerful users and um, and, uh, and 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 yet on the other hand, um, it's often done after these individuals have been allowed to violate the terms of service of the platforms themselves for such a long time. Um, and so, you know, we're in a very interesting, different place than we were a couple of years ago. Um, I think one thing that's consistent is, you know. Um, there's some talk about uh, more regulation of platforms, but you know, still governments, certainly um, most governments, uh, well, let's say Canadian and American governments don't want to be in this game of making these tough calls about what politicians can say and, and, they, and they shouldn't be. So, so I think the harm reduction parts of things um, from a policy perspective, again, are about um, addressing the, the, the really, uh, the illegal material, the stuff that's more clear cut. Um, but I think also finding ways to support the groups and initiatives that are designing alternatives. And, you know, a public broadcaster is doing one, uh, is, you know, one um, important source of, of higher quality information, but there's uh, everything from um, other kind of startup enterprises looking at, um, new types of platforms and um, new ways of using the platforms, um, community groups that are just putting a lot of effort into building up more productive conversations in, in local areas. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, I think we need to, yeah, really think about policies that can um, look at the other side of the ledger too and, and creating those kind of trusted, um, higher quality and, and engaging sources of information as, as a form of harm reduction. Uh, I'd like to pick up on a question that we have from the audience and that I think we've we've touched around so far. And Chris, you mentioned the zero sum game. Is the difference in part in the US and Canada, the difference between the two party system in the US and a more uh, multi party system in Canada? Um, is that part of what's playing into this feeling of it being a zero sum game and that you know, if I don't get my message out um, or if my message is restricted, that automatically helps you. Yeah, I just say, yes, I think it is. Um, I think that's a big, big part of it. And having lived in the States for a, a few years in the past, you know, um, the way in which things boil down to, um, or with this team or that team is, is pretty striking. And, and we know from the research that this has gotten um, more, uh, uh, more prevalent and that our part of, part, the American partisan identification is much stronger and, um, and overlaps with other forms of um, social identity and location more strongly than it has in the past. And so it's a, it's a challenge to deal with, yeah. And we're, and we're somewhat um, 
protected from that in Canada because we have more viable parties. Um, and um, and if you you know if you're unhappy, deeply unhappy with the Conservatives, you can find maybe the Liberals aren't so far away from that. Um, you know, so there is that kind of movement. You can't. It, it is hard to have a very unpopular leader of one party and not have more supporters able to find a party that isn't you know um, anathema to them. And I think that's more of a challenge in the American situation. As well as sorry to go on, but as well as just more use more. Um, partisan ownership of different parts of government. And that goes back to something Commissioner Weintraub was talking about earlier on with you know, these at county level and others, like more political attempts to be in control of election apparatus, which is something that um, we, we just don't have as much here. Well, I mean, speaking about election apparatus, I mean, you and Elections Canada have an entirely different system for how you administer the uh, the elections, you know, it's a it's a nonpartisan uh, administrator who is chosen usually by acclaim by the parliament. You know, they don't people don't try and game that system. They try and find somebody that everyone feels comfortable with, uh, and uh, it's a it's a completely professional and, and nonpartisan approach to election administration. And of course, it covers the entire country, uh, and we don't have that. Um, and I think that is, uh, as I think I alluded to earlier, I think that that the uh, partisan nature of a lot of election administration is a big problem in the United States. It's a, it's been a problem for a while, but I think it's it's getting worse. Uh, we've had um, uh, it's a longstanding tradition that the chief election official in any particular state is somebody who is an elected official. You know, it's frequently the Secretary of State, but they are elected to do that job. And they have some stake in running a fair election and being able to take credit for running an election with integrity. Uh, what we're seeing now are attempts by state legislatures to overrule the decision of the, uh, of the Secretary of State or the, the designated election administrators and, and put it in the hands of even more partisan uh, operators, which I think is really risky and again is going to undermine faith in, in the democratic system that we've got. Um, in terms of having more parties, I'm open to it. Um, uh, we, had, uh, we had a request a while back from uh, a group as to whether our, the way we organize our political debates and the regulations that govern, uh, govern them, you know, really sort of make it only, a, practically speaking, available to uh, the Democrats and the Republicans, and and I voted to support doing a rule, you know, revising those rules and seeing if we could make them more uh, open. But we did not have the votes on the commission to actually uh, do that. The two-party system is fairly entrenched, and I think what a lot of people in the United States would say about that is that it's it is perhaps not strong enough uh, in an age of super PACs and uh, where very wealthy individuals can sort of fund their own political organization that works um, sort of as a shadow party operation without the transparency, without the accountability of a, of a real political party, that the parties are being undermined by these outside groups. Uh, and that uh, there, there's uh, some sentiment in the states that what we need to do is shore up the traditional parties and, and not further undermine them. So that's a different take on, on, uh, on the party system. Well, everyone, we're running out of time and we're getting to the end of our 90 minute session today. So maybe I should conclude, Claire. So uh, that this is the end of our presentation today. Uh, I would encourage all of you participants, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, carry on the debate. Uh, this is a very timely and important issue. And uh, as elections are coming up, uh, certainly in the States next year and then potentially in Canada this fall, uh, that aspect of this disinformation issue is, is certainly important. Uh, I want on behalf of the uh, American Bar Association Civil Rights and Social Justice sec section and our Canadian Bar Association National Constitutional Law and Human Rights section to thank all of you again for joining us today in this free webinar. We want to encourage you to check out other webinars in the ABA free speech series. There's a link uh, to that uh, page, web page in the chat. You can find additional information there. Uh, also want to express our gratitude to our esteemed group of panelists today. Thank all three of you for uh, Ellen, Goodman, uh, Ellen Weintraub, uh, Yves Gamon, and Chris Tineau for joining us and providing uh, 
taking the time to share your thoughts and in insights and expertise with us. You're all doing such important and critical work uh, in this area for sure. I also wanna thank my co-moderator, Claire, and our coordinator, Ali, uh, professors uh, Steve Wormiel and uh, on my side of the border, Professor Errol Mendez for their help in putting together this webinar series. And my, co my chairperson, Heather Petrachi, uh, the CBA, of, of my, uh, the chair of my section, who uh, really spearheaded our uh, getting together with our ABA friends and colleagues and getting this going. Uh, just a little plug for the ABA. The ABA section of Civil Rights and Social Justice does provide free webinars and resources for legal professionals and advocates throughout the US. Uh, we hope this type of uh, service helps you, uh, those of our American colleagues and friends in your work want to encourage any of you who are not members to consider joining and becoming active in the ABA. And you can find that at ambar.org uh, and there's a membership link in that website. On uh, the Canadian side, the Canadian Bar Association uh, section that I'm in, uh, we're among many active groups within the CBA. Uh, we see the CBA as an essential ally and advocate for all of our members uh, who are lawyers, judges and, and paralegals. Uh, we're all dedicated to supporting rule of law and improving administrative administration of justice and access to justice throughout Canada. Uh, and uh, if you're not already a member of the CBA, we certainly encourage you to join us. It's a great way to connect with other colleagues and help us carry on the good work that the Canadian Bar Association does uh, in advocacy uh, in the justice system. And there you can just uh, check out cba.org. There's a membership link in the website and uh, that's an easy spot to, uh, to join in if you aren't already a member. So just stay safe, everyone. Uh, thanks again for joining us, and we hope you all have an enjoyable summer. Take care.